We are in Ruth, the second chapter today. We add another character to our cast today, and it's a very important character. There are three personalities, basically, in the book of Ruth. The first is Naomi, and Naomi is a picture of a backslidden believer. We talked about that, chapter 1, which talked how she wandered away from the Lord and uh, the terrible price she paid for wandering away. We are shown in the end that she does return back to the place of blessing, back to Bethlehem, her hometown, after being in Moab for 10 years. And she is a lesson of hope for all those who have turned their backs on God and on the things of God. Guys, we may give up hope on people, but God never does. God has got a plan for the worst of sinners. He's got the plan for the worst of backsliders. And with Him, there's always hope if you have Him in your heart and your life. We'll talk a lot about Boaz today. Boaz, uh, uh, we'll figure out who he is and, and what his deal is in this book. And He is a, believe it or not, Boaz is a clear picture of of Jesus Christ. <laughs> no, he's not Jesus Christ. He is a picture or, a, or an example of what Jesus Christ would be. And then there's this Gentile girl named Ruth. She's a young lady from a pagan country who comes to know the true God, a new convert, a new believer. She is a, a, a young Christian who is a beginning to learn about and grow in the things of God. And now she's in a place where she can grow. She could not grow that way in Moab. She's just beginning to experience the great blessings of the Lord and His grace. And we see here a woman who is searching for grace. What is grace? Well, we I can say unmerited favor, but I'm going to bring it down a little bit. You're going to get something good when you deserve something bad. And if we all examined our lives, I think we'd understand we don't deserve things good. But God in His grace will give it to us. And so that's what she's searching for. Let me express to you how you felt when you came to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, do you remember that feeling? Do you remember that burden being lifted and how much you just, you, you just, well, you were, your life had changed and you felt it. A true conversion will have somewhat of that in it. It's not clinical. There are some feelings involved, but it's not about feelings. It's about what you've done. She's a, and, the, and then the question is, now what? Once, you, once you've accepted Christ as your Savior, now what? Well, is it all over with? Is there anything else to it? No, it's about finding His grace. It's about finding the blessings in, his, in, the life, in your life that God wants you to have. I think that if there were tears in heaven, we would find that there, the tears when we shed would be for the, all the blessings that we missed out on in this life. The ones that God had planned for us. And so we're going to look at these three people today. And primarily it's going to be, we're going to be looking at what Ruth does. I will do a whole lot of, I, if, Terry has a thing that if we ever got stranded on, on an island by ourselves and there's no food. And well, they don't stand a chance because I'm going to eat. I'll do whatever it takes to eat. Now, that's, I know that. But we'll do what it takes to eat, right? And here we find Ruth and Naomi with no way of getting anything to eat. Let's look. at the. She is searching for something right now, but she is searching for food. In verse 2, So Ruth the Moabitess, said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her daughter, uh, said to her, Go, my daughter. 
What she was doing was searching for food. It's not like going to a fast food restaurant today. It's not like going to the grocery store today. I mean, they have their own little ecosystem there, their, their system of, of food, and, and, and they were completely out of it. Uh, Ruth wants to go to the fields, and she wants to glean ears of corn. <coughs> she wants to go glean ears of corn. And the main thrust of her search is to find food for the body. And she illustrates that, that that desire that is birthed at the conversion of a Christian. When, you're, when you first are converted, do you have a desire to know more about God and to grow in Him? You have that desire. I don't know how long it lasted, but whether it was for five minutes, for ten years, whatever it was, you had a desire to know God better and a desire to learn of God. It's learning to partake of the Word of God that causes growth in the life of the believer. I would not eat if I was not hungry. And guess what? There's a lot of folks today who are not eating and partaking of the Word of God because they're not hungry. They have no desire. some ways I understand but in some ways it just baffles me how when we how often we pass up chances to learn more about God from his word too many people are going on a spiritual diet and feasting on the things of this world instead to fulfill their hunger when it lays bare opportunities, you have opportunities not just in your own home but in church to come and partake of God's Word to learn more. And what it tells me and it tells the world and it should be telling you is that you really don't want to know more. That you're not hungry for the spiritual Word. Uh, spiritual word. She was searching for food. Something for her body to help her, well, to keep her alive. She was searching for favor she says, I shall, that I shall find grace. Ruth was asking for some landowner who would accept her and allow him, her to glean from his fields. In spite of her nationality, in spite of her past, in spite of who she was, she was looking for grace. She needed grace from someone to be able to provide for her and for Naomi. And she pictures the newborn child of God who wants more than anything to please the Lord. <coughs> you know the time you said, what would Jesus think? What would Jesus do? This is just part of having Him as your first love. What happened? What happened to where no longer is He our first love? To where we think about what Jesus would think? We're no longer going to His Word, feeding from His table, but now we're just we're more worried about what the world is going to think than we are Christ. Many like Ruth worry about being accepted by the Lord, though. If you're worried about not being accepted by God, let me tell you something. Your past sins are no longer an issue with God. If you're saved by the grace of God, your past sins are forgiven and gone for good. He has given you a brand new start in 2 Corinthians 5.17. 2 Corinthians 5.17 It says that Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You become a new creature. Your past is no longer relevant. Now everybody else might not know that, but God knows it. And God's going to look at you in that way and not the way the world looks at you. 
So she was searching for food. She was searching for favor. But she was also searching for fulfillment in life. Her statement, let me go, let me now go, is she was, she was ready to try to take care of her and Naomi. Ruth simply wanted to serve. She just wanted to be there. She wanted to do her part. Again, this is a picture of a new believer. And when a person is saved by the grace of God, they want to do something for the glory of God. They want to serve Jesus. Guys, where is our willingness to serve? Are we so far removed from our conversion, from our the, 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 the joy of our salvation, that we no longer are wanting to serve? We're no longer wanting to eat? We're no longer wanting to, serve, to, to get, his, get in His favor? Have we totally turned around and rejected Him? Ruth, a new convert, someone who is experiencing God for the first time in her life, is searching for Him. She's looking for His favor. She wants to find grace. And she's looking for fulfillment. There are so many people today who are looking for their life to be fulfilled. They're looking to that big old empty place in their hearts that they're looking for something to fill it. Nothing of this world will fill it. When I get hungry, and I eat and I eat and I eat, eventually I will get hungry again and again. Which accounts for a lot of things. I will continue to get hungry until the day that I pass from this life. But when I am filled with God's Spirit, when I am filled with God's Word, when I take His Word and I fill it in my life, that is when I find true fulfillment. She's looking for food that will temporarily solve the problems, but God is planning something much greater than that. He is planning for something that will permanently fill their lives. And we see that in the providence of her search. Let's read verse Three in the providence of her search. Then she left and went and gleaned in the fields after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Paul, oh, who's Elimelech? See, that would be Naomi's husband. Alright. Just happened to happen. She goes to the field and she begins her search. She has no idea. She is from a totally foreign country and she goes and she picks this field who is a, a family member of Elimelech. Her father-in-law. Ruth went to the field and began to glean. And she was able to do this. Oh, by the way, you know what gleaning means? They would, that's the leftovers. They would come in, they would allow, well, let's just read it. Let's just read it in, uh, uh, let's read it in Leviticus 9, 19. He says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. What's left over? In verse 10. And we know that... Uh, oh, that's not it. Okay. Other words, by law, they were supposed to leave the corners and they were supposed to leave... Ah, there you go. And you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. Ye shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. By law, they were supposed to leave some for the poor. And for the foreigners. Don't tell me God's not compassionate. God, don't tell me God hadn't figured out a way. They, were, they weren't supposed to kick the field clean. And so she was taking advantage of this. God had worked in her past to take care of her present need. This was in Leviticus hundreds of years before. God anticipated that there would be a young lady from Moabite that was going to need food 
that was going to go to a particular field, he knew this. He prepared this. He worked in her past to take care of her present need. The same is true in the book of the Life of Believer. Our present standing in Jesus was made possible because of what God did in the past. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, everything we have and are today is a product of the past work of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. It says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Wow. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Everything we are a product of what he did on the cross of Calvary. He prepared ahead of time for who we are to be today. Just as he prepared before Ruth ever, I mean, uh, Ruth ever entered the country, he knew and had this plan. The verse says that it was her hap or happened. Happened. To go into the field owned by his, by this man named Boaz. And, and by, it, it just looks like, from a human point of view, that it just happened. You know, it was just happenstance. It's just a coincidence. Really? Think about where she was months earlier. She was in a wash pot of a place called Moab. Her husband had died. There was nowhere for her to go, and she decided to take Naomi's God. And they made, this, they made this trip, this dangerous trip to Bethlehem. And there they knew no one. There was no job, no nothing. And it just happens that she goes to the field of a relative of her father-in-law's. No. Let me tell you, from God's perspective, this was sovereignty in action. He had already determined that there was going to be a wedding. Oh, spoiler alert. There's going to be a wedding. They're going to fall in love and there's going to be a baby for Ruth. He knew this ahead of time. He, he knew this and planned it. And yet, in our circumstances of life, we say there is no hope. There's no way that God's going to get us out of this situation. There's nothing in store for me for the rest of my life. And you know what? That is defeatist talk right there. That is a lack of faith on our part when we see how God can move and turn things around and how He is just putting the pieces of the chessboard in place for your ultimate blessing and all you got to do is follow Him. All you got to do is believe Him. All you got to do is trust Him. That's all you got to do. And yet we don't. Ruth doesn't know it. But the Lord is pulling the strings of her life to get her in the right place at the right time. Just as the Lord worked in Luke Bruce's life, He works in our lives. Nothing happens by accident. He moves powerfully and providentially to bring about His will in your life and in mine. And that is why we can have confidence as a believer. God is always working and moving in our lives to accomplish one goal. He is reproducing His Son in every saint of God. In Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are the called according, or the called according to His purpose. Wow. We need to start trusting Him. It may look like that we're at the very bottom. It may look like that we're, we're, we're uh, cleaning up leftovers and that's all there is, that there's no hope out of this situation. But let me tell you, you don't know what God's got for you from just around the corner. Don't give up on it. Don't give up hope in your life. Don't turn to the world to solve your problems when God has already got it all figured out for you. 
And then we come to the person in her search. It's amazing. She thought that she was looking for a meal. But God was about to introduce her to a man. <laughs> Let's look at verse 1. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Imelech. His name was Boaz. She went to find some food and God was about to give her a new family. And although Ruth doesn't know it, she thinks she's looking for food, but the real object of the search is Boaz. Notice what the Bible teaches about this man. He was a related man. <coughs> this verse tells us he was a kinsman. He was just what Ruth needed, although Ruth had no clue. She wasn't a Jew. She had no clue what a, a near kinsman would, could do for her. We'll talk more about a kinsman redeemer a little later on. But man, you, you talk about some good stuff when you start talking about a, a kinsman redeemer. Boaz was uniquely qualified to perform the role of a kinsman redeemer to these widows according to the law of God. Boaz, in this sense, is a type of Jesus Christ, our redeemer. He became a kinsman to us that He might redeem us from all, all of our sins. In Philippians 2, 5 and 8. Philippians 2, 5 and 8. Let this mind be in you, which is also in, in, uh, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but, he, but made Himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men but made himself of no reputation. I just read that. Okay, that's my fault. You see what I'm talking about here? He came and he made himself a man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and giving him the name which is above every name. Now, what we find here is he's a related. He is the one. He made himself one of us so that he could save us. He became a man in order to save us. He became a kinsman redeemer. He was a rich man. He was a, a mighty man of wealth. And this means that Boaz possessed all the necessary resources to carry the task of redemption. In other words, he could have been a kinsman, but if he hadn't been rich, he would not have been able to, to redeem her. Jesus Christ has the sufficient resources to redeem us. He can do it. It is not beyond him to do that. He possesses infinite grace. It doesn't matter how many times you sin. It does not matter the severity of your sin. It does not matter who you've done wrong and what you said in your past. It doesn't matter how many times that you found yourself deep in the mud hole of sin. It does not matter. His grace is sufficient for us. He completed God's plan for redemption in its entirety. And now God is satisfied. Now salvation may, be, may not back, uh, may be free, but it wasn't cheap. You can still be saved if you'll come to Jesus by faith. He was a respected man. He was a mighty man. It says in his name actually means. In it is strength. And so it sounds like he was very respected, upright man, lots of money, had his own fields. And it is this man that Ruth will meet, he will fall in love, she will fall in love with, and come to know intimately. In Philippians 2 9 through 11. 
It says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and of things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and to the glory of God the Father. He, there's no one that could save us like Jesus. Just as there's no one that could save Ruth and Naomi but Boaz. Men bow off the name of Jesus and they use his name as a byword or a cuss word. But in heaven, that name invokes worship and celebration. And of course, one day he'll receive respect he is due from all men. In Romans 14.11 it says this. Romans 14.11 says, For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Every knee shall bow. Can I suggest to you that if you're going to bow your knee and confess His name to do it on this earth, instead of, look, you know, instead of later on, and waiting before when it's too late. Every knee will bow. One way or the other before him. Let's do that today. Before it's too late for you. Three questions I want to give you today. They're simple. You know the answers, and all you have to do is be honest with dealing with them. Are you saved? Say yes. But maybe you're not a church member, or maybe you dropped out of church. Maybe you're not a good person. Maybe you've done, maybe as a saved child of God, you've done some terrible things, but you are truly born again. If you're that way, if you have backslidden so far, Think about it. Are you in that position? Or if, if you're saved and you're not, you know, you're going to church, you're doing right, can you honestly say that you're growing in the Lord as you, you should be? And it's God's desire that you grow. And 2 Peter 3.18, it tells us that he, we need to grow. The third question. Are you hungry for something in your spiritual life that you do not have right now? If so, it is available from the Lord in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. It tells us, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Are you lost? Are you here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ into your heart and your life? You're lost and you're looking for salvation. You're looking for that something to fill that gigantic hole in your heart and you don't know what it is. Maybe you're trying the, the, the things of the world, the religions of the world, but none of them fulfill you the way it needs to. It's because you, you're filling it with something that's not designed. Only God can fill that heart. And what are you looking for in life? God has what each of you are looking for in life. If you'll come to Him, and you'll get it. And it's up to us. Now, Ruth was looking for food. But God had something greater, far greater plan for her. Can I give you a little hint? Would you, why don't you look up in the genealogy of Jesus? There's some women in there to see why this is so important. Why God, what God, what blessing God had prepared for them. A young woman from Moab, Moab who somehow made her way to Bethlehem. Who came to know Jesus Christ, or came to know God as her Lord. Who came to to go to a certain field of the only person in the entire world that could redeem her. No, God knew what He was doing. 
And He knows what He's doing in your life. As long as you're following Him. As long as you're allowing Him to dictate your life instead of you dictating your own. Trust in God for what's around the corner. Because Ruth didn't have a clue while was awaiting her what God was willing to do for her life. If you're here today and you've never experienced God's love in your life, you've never experienced His everlasting salvation, can I let you in on the secret? You, it doesn't matter what you try to fill that hole with it in your life. It doesn't matter what you're looking for. The only thing you should be looking for is His salvation. His grace. It's the only thing that matters in the end. And you know what? You may look, you may be looking for food this direction. You may be looking for pleasure over here. You may be, but God is constantly maneuvering things to try to get you to the place where you'll find His, ever, His everlasting salvation. The thing that you need the most. Would you? I think if you're here today, you're in that place. You're hearing the message. Would you act upon it and ask Him into your heart, to your life? A saved child of God, maybe you're backslidden. Maybe you're far, far away from Him and you think there's no hope and God will never take you back. His grace is sufficient for you. And he's still got plans for you. Believe it or not, He's still got plans for you. Why don't you come back to Him and find out the, what blessings he's got, he's got for you. The saved child of God sitting here today who maybe you've lost your passion. Maybe you not. Maybe you don't want to partake of the spiritual food anymore. Maybe it's more of that sawdust than we talked about last week. Maybe you're trying to find favor with the world. Maybe you're trying to find fulfillment with the things of this world. And you've lost your passion, you've lost your joy, and you're searching for things that will make you happy. Come back to God. <coughs> get back in His Word. Get back in His worship. Find, try to please Him instead of the world. And I can guarantee you, God will, will fulfill your life. If you'll just come to it. So this morning, I don't know where you stand, but these three people represent some very wonderful things in this life. With Christ, with Boaz, with Christ, with Ruth, a new convert, and Naomi as a backslidden who is on her way home. Back to God. May you have hope in your life today. As we stand and prepare for an invitation, I don't know your heart, I don't know your life, I don't know what God desires for you. But I'll tell you this, you may go through rough places and rough patches in life, and sometimes God leads you to those places so He can get you to the good place that He needs, wants you to be ultimately. Don't stop. Don't stop following Him simply because it's gotten hard or it's gotten hopeless. He's the master of hopelessness. He's the one that can take our hopelessness and, and turn it into joy if you'll just follow Him. So as we sing this morning,